Hello, today I'm here with uh, Professor Charles Cockle. He is a professor at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, Professor, can you tell us what your exact uh, faculty and what your um, title is in your university? I think it's rather interesting. Yes, th thank you, Chris. It's good to be here. So I'm, um, I'm a professor of astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm interested in life in extreme environments. When I say life, I mean microbes and mm -hmm. other life forms in extreme environments. Uh, what that tells us about the limits and possibilities of life on Earth uh, and what it might tell us about life elsewhere and how we might look for life elsewhere. That includes exoplanets in, outside our solar system, right? Yeah, it includes planets in our own solar system, but also these exoplanets that are mm -hmm. being found orbiting distant planets. And in the process, while we, while we try and understand whether these planets could host life, we learn something about life on Earth and some of its practical uses as well, whether that be from you know, medicine to mining and other uses of of life in the in these in these applied approaches. Are we getting closer to finding finding abiogenesis? Is that something that you guys I are think, looking at? I think we know a lot more than we did say yeah. twenty years ago. Whether we're getting any closer to finding life elsewhere, of course, is something mm -hmm. that no one knows, and that's one of the reasons why one goes out to other planets uh, like Mars or the icy moons of the outer solar system or these exoplanets to look for life uh, and. It's, it's not possible to predict what the, what, what the chances are of finding life. The only way that you can test that is to go out and look for it. So uh, which body do you think is most likely to have life besides Earth in our solar system? Uh, perhaps the most promising place that we found is Enceladus, which is the moon of Saturn. Mm -hmm. And the reason why people are enthusiastic about that place is because it's got jets of water being erupted from the south pole of the moon. And in those jets are some of the ingredients for life, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon. So it's the first place in the solar system in the present day where we found large quantities of liquid water and good evidence for all the requirements for life, including nutrients and energy. And that's one of the reasons why people are very, uh, not necessarily optimistic about life, but enthusiastic about using mm -hmm. it to, to test the question of, is there life there or not? So uh, I understand why it's important for science in general and for the whole planet, but what makes it important for Ukraine? Yeah, I, I say two things about science in general. The first thing is that asking these sorts of questions, is there life beyond Earth? These may seem very ephemeral questions, but they're very important for uh, developing the culture and capabilities of, of science in any country. So science is a fundamentally uh, anti-authoritarian activity. It encourages people to question uh, the universe around mm -hmm. us. Scientists never accept final truths in anything. Right. Uh, so the, the, the culture of science is conducive to open democratic deliberation in any society. Uh, and so encouraging a, a healthy scientific community and healthy public discourse in science, I think is very important. It's important everywhere. It's also important uh, in, in Ukraine as it seeks to recover its civil society and build its civil society uh, now and into the future. So, of course, the question of life in the universe is, is one particular question, but it sits within the wider context of uh, developing a, a robust and, and successful scientific community. And I think it's very important to encourage that uh, here in Ukraine. And, and the inquiry well. processes that you use, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, you were here for a conference. Can you tell us what you spoke about at that conference? Yes, yeah, so this was the InScience conference, which uh -huh. is a very impressive conference. And it's a, an interesting mixture of science, um, young Ukrainian entrepreneurs, uh, business leaders, so a mixture of science and business. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about having a healthy scientific community can help develop industries and new companies. So this is a, a conference developed by a group called in science, um, a very impressive group of, of young scientists and business leaders. And there were a range of talks from uh, artificial intelligence to medicine. And I was talking about uh, life elsewhere in the universe, uh, the search for life, why now is a particularly exciting time with the technology that we have to try and answer this question, and then touching on some of what we were talking about. Why do we go and ask these questions at all? And why would they be important to people now uh, and people outside the scientific community, including 
uh, the, the broader political and economic environment of, of Ukraine and other countries. Which brings me to our, my final question, which is, you've been a regular contributor to Kiev Post for quite a while now, and we, uh, I know as part of the editorial team, we really enjoy Good. working with your pieces, and I just wanted to know what brought you to write for Kiev Post and be so enthusiastic a, a contributor to our work here. That it, it's, that's an interesting question. I consider myself to be a, a classical liberal, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I believe in the fundamental ideas of um, accountable government, uh, f freedom of expression, uh, freedom of, of conscience, all these things that conscience, free, free, all these things that we consider to be aspects of what one might broadly describe as a free society. And I happen to be a scientist, and I believe in science playing a role in creating the conditions for open societies. And so I felt, uh, I suppose, moved to begin to write articles f f for Kiev Post exploring some of these issues in freedom and science and the interface between those two things. Um, I hadn't really thought before the beginning of, of the full-scale invasion about writing articles in this area, although I've certainly written papers about societies on other planets mm -hmm. and how you might build civil society and free societies on Mars, but that's, again, a rather sort of futuristic discussion. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it, it, in terms of the connection with Kiev Post, I was keen to, um, to discuss some of these ideas, at least to express some of my own ideas about why I think that the defense of, of free societies is important, uh, how science plays a role in that, the connections between those two things, and then just to explore some of the philosophical and practical bases of, of, um, of how one builds uh, open democratic societies. And it's been, um, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to write for the newspaper and, and just express these views. And I hope, if nothing more, it, it contributes to a wider set of discussions and deliberations about how one builds uh, vibrant free societies, how that might be done in Ukraine, how, how reconstruction might occur within the context of maintaining and building Ukraine's civil society. And in some of the sort of, I suppose, um, uh, sort of broader and slightly deeper political philosophical questions that people have raised for centuries about what is liberty, what do we mean by individual freedom, and uh, what are the limits of freedom. And of course, uh, the current situation is an, is an important one in which to think about these questions. So this is like the Ukrainian Enlightenment? Perhaps. You know, that's a really good way of putting it. Uh, some people don't like using the word Enlightenment because they, they think of it as part of, um, uh, I suppose, uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century European colonialism. But the ideas of the Enlightenment really have nothing to do that with that. They happen mm. to have been contemporaneous. But the idea of uh, liberal societies that in, that encourage freedom of expression and, and, and accountable government and checks and balances in the executive of government and so on and so forth. These ideas are very profound. They're uh, largely Western ideas, not exclusively, but the Western world was the place where these ideas were, were elaborated. You know, John Stuart Mill, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, one could mm -hmm. go on and on mm -hmm. with the names of people who uh, wrote books advancing these ideas. And of course, um, here in Ukraine, I mean, it would be too simplistic just to say that Ukraine is following those ideas. It's doing it within its own right. cultural its own. and historical context. But, but the fundamental ideas, I think, are the same. So if you wanted to call it the, Euro the Ukrainian Enlightenment, you could do that. But I think it, would be, it wouldn't be an inaccurate phrase to use in terms of the generality of the ideas that, that, you, that Ukraine uh, is pursuing and uh, att attempting to incorporate w within the civil society that it's trying to build. It's great. Thank you very much, Professor, for sharing this time with us. Thanks a lot, Chris. It's good to be back here.